Hello and welcome back to another episode of What Do People Do podcast with Leo Edgar, Eddie Duncan, Charlie Goldson. And today I'm very, very excited. We've got a special guest with us. Um, if you're a physio like me and Eddie, you might be excited. Even if you're not, you might also be excited. <laughs> but um, if you could introduce yourself, give us your name and, and kind of your title. Yeah, I can't help but judge you for having such a low calibre guest on. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing is that any anyone that's excited needs to have serious words for himself. <laughs> so it's really nice to catch up with you lads and nice to meet each other. I'm Jack Chu. I'm a physiotherapist and I had the pleasure of having you lads as uh, students on placement with me a couple of years ago. So it's been interesting to see that you've gone on to put microphones under people's noses, which is another one of my hobbies. Yeah, I think you must have inspired us somehow. <laughs> Maybe. But um, I'd like to start the podcast off how we normally start it and kind of dive deeper a bit into your past and why you kind of chose to be a physio. What was your, your dream job when you were little? Was it physio or was it something different? Well, I don't know how young I was that I even knew what a physio was, if I'm honest. I had some injuries as a, as a sporty kid uh, that certainly introduced me to physio. Mm -hmm. um, but I was torn between being a physio and being a journalist. And I could not decide uh, at all between those two things. I can't remember exactly why those two things, but they were both of massive interest of mine. And so I then eventually um, went down the physio route, uh, fairly straightforward, and through A levels and straight in, didn't have a gap year, anything like that. And then within about 18 months of being a physio, I invented physio journalism. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, had I been a journalist, uh, I'd have probably ended up being a health writer. You know, I, I clearly, yeah. I, I, I thought I'd decided and never really had to. And so, yeah, it's not quite journalism, don't get me wrong, but I kind of never had to fully, you know, I never scratched, I never stopped scratching that itch to, to do a bit of both. And I've been fortunate enough to do uh, both. Yeah. Was, was there like a defining moment or someone that inspired you to choose physio over journalism? No, I don't think so. I think it was just a, I, I, a big bug of, of, of mine was like everything scientific, especially yeah. human biology and stuff, was just always interested in the grey areas and stuff, compared to, say, hard sciences, say, physics or maths or statistics, mm -hmm. et cetera. It started to not be, not be as interesting as some of the, some of the nuances and vagaries I guess that kind of definitely is central to physio and then and then I just didn't fancy medicine I don't think I think mm. the, the the idea of there being say exercise or, or even you know for, for that point a cursory knowledge of manual therapies or the things that have been done with or to me as a patient I kind of thought that was a more of interest than say um, and, and five years <laughs> possibly <laughs> maybe I don't know I don't know and I, I now look on and I'm I'm not just jealous of medics for five years at uni. I'm jealous of architects for seven years at uni. I remember <laughs> they were the lads that I were jealous of is because I honestly still nostalgic over my time yeah. at uni. And so I don't look on and think, oh, it was quicker to get it done in three or whatever. I'm just jealous of those that were in architecture doing seven years at yeah. the glorious <laughs> University of Nottingham. I'm still upset about that. <laughs> so so once you kind of went through uni and graduated as a physio, did you, did you know that... You wanted to go into a, a first job as a physio in the NHS, or what? What was your thinking around that? Yeah, well, I was always, I always knew that I was passionate about MSK, and I'd managed to strike lucky on a few things placement-wise to have a very MSK-centric placement uh, time, um, and and so that was always my direction of travel. Massively awkward jobs market when we graduated, so there were only three, uh, three permanent um, NHS. Um, large trusts i guess that were recruiting junior rotations at the time and um most people had to go and do you had to just take what you could get so it was mm. temporary stuff at three months i mean for example my now wife charlotte she I took a three month job in grimsby doing a right. rotation to try yeah. and just hope that there'd be maybe some funding extended because it was just a really difficult wow. jobs market and so I got one of very few rotational band five permanent jobs, but it was in Margate in Kent. It's about <laughs> far away from either I grew up or I, you know, it was just a million miles away. And um, and so went down went down there um, just to just to take something mm. um, as a rotational job and took a community rotation first off and immediately leverage that into I want MSK next and stuff. Look how far I've moved. Look how much I've given to you put me out into the community straight out the gates, which isn't not great for a new starter or whatever, yeah. but I, I've, I've mucked in for the team. I want MSK. And then once I went into that as a, as a rotation in MSK, I've then doubled down on that and never left it really. I got a, got an MSK job back up in Nottingham from that and the rest is history. But physio, I think it, I did want it as a career. You know, as soon as I, as soon as I was in amongst it, 
I think had I knew that if I hadn't had gone straight in at that point, I'd have loved to have gone travelling with some of my mates and stuff at the time. Yeah. But I don't think I'd have ever. I don't think I'd. Have, I, 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 I'm, it sounds a bit dramatic. I don't think I'd have never managed to been a physio. I don't think I'd have managed to get a career. If I'd have gone to find myself on a beach in Fiji, like, <laughs> I wouldn't have come home, I don't think. I just wasn't ready. In yeah. way. So I needed to just get on with it and get a job. Uh, I think my parents <coughs> knew that as well. So, I, so yeah, I, I, once I realised physio, once I was doing physio, that I was going to be a physio. Yeah. It really suited me. It did. Yeah, definitely. So you worked out in the community for how long? A rotation's worth will be about six months, I think. About six months, okay. And then, so obviously I know you wanted to go into MSK from university. How do you think um, it, the community sort of differed to MSK? Did you treat uh, MSK patients in the community or was it more sort of rehab and people with falls and things like yeah, that? Yeah, it was a community. So it's misleading, isn't it, me saying community. It wasn't like nomadic where you go to home visits and stuff. You did a bit of that, but it was mm -hmm. a community rehab unit for mainly elderly step-down care. And then mm -hmm. so you'd see a bit of a variety. You'd see some neuro and some a couple of amputees, which is interesting. But uh, as generally, it was like a step-down rehab centre. Right. For, that had been discharged yeah. into, and then you were trying to get them home. So sometimes you'd do some home visit stuff from that. But it was more that, uh, when I say community, it was more that it was outside of the hospital trust. It was an associated placement. So it yeah. felt quite detached, especially having moved away. I wasn't then in amongst a larger team, which is why I'd gone to one of these large teaching hospitals, albeit in, in Margate. So, um, so that's one of the reasons I always remember it being... Mm -hmm. Remember it fondly in lots of ways, just because it's oh, you remember your first rotation, but also it was the ability for me to then say, look, I've done everyone a favour here, and that, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to try and get my my next best uh, rotation, and I was I was right in thinking that that was what I wanted to do. And then, yeah. So, so when when was that? What, what so what year was it when you when you qualified from uni, and then you obviously the jobs market was really really tough. 2010, I qualified. 2010, and why why was it so difficult? Because the NHS, so I thought the the best years in the NHS to recent times were sort of 2006 2008 so 2010 that's not too far away from that so why, why were jobs so scarce so that so 2006 2008 being the best years yeah the so NHS from 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 what i from what, I, what i've been told um 2008 seems to be quite a good year well, 2008, what 2008 in terms of job opportunities yeah so i mean i don't know why that would be well i think it's interesting i, I wonder I'm trying to think what you might be meaning by why that was so good. There's different phases that people will say is a sort of great time that they found working in there for, say, work pressures or some of the politics or whatever. Mm -hmm. But as far as the jobs market goes, there's a phase, I think, I'm at the tail end of that phase, where I think between, say, 2004, maybe, 2000 to 2010, mm -hmm. you just had more graduates than you had jobs. Right. It was just that, I don't know, I can't remember the situation of it, especially because I wasn't as close to yeah. the politics of it or, or knowing the profession so well then. But I just know that it was a basic supply and demand thing whereby there weren't the jobs for the graduates. And so there were lots of people that got lost at that point. And it was around that time that they stopped mandating that, because we were all on bursaries, and they had to stop mandating that you had to go and serve your time in the NHS because they paid for your degree. They couldn't they couldn't have people hanging on for years. Yeah. And so around that time, they stopped making that happen. Um, so I'm trying to work out, like it could have been a glory time to work in the NHS for whatever reason, but yeah. I don't think it was a right. hot spot for recruitment because it was okay. struggling to do it. Now, you've got a... F um, it's just interesting. It's like a buyer or seller's market for yeah. labour where at that point we struggle for jobs, but you guys graduated into a situation where it's like, where do you want to work? Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm, fair play. You know, even you lot had got jobs, right? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm like, you know, it blows my mind that anyone have you, but anyone would have. And obviously I jest because you were good lads and, and, and good at what you do. Sorry, Charlie, you're talking shop a lot here. But, <laughs> um, it's more that you really, you really could. I mean, it's, it's just people crying out for... For, for any therapy, yeah. particularly, you know, you lads have got something about you, um, interest, enthusiasm, you, you could have worked wherever you fancied in the country. It just it just wasn't that. And I think it was just a basic supply and demand thing that then has yeah. flipped the other way. And now we've got, you know, all sorts of supply side uh, problems where we've got um, too many of you in yeah. some ways. Now that's all, there is a, it's a good thing that that's happened, but it's just that you've got, you've got to keep those things in balance. Otherwise, everyone, someone yeah. can be miserable for different reasons. So when you're in this community role and you knew kind of that it was a starting point, but you, it wasn't where you wanted to finish. You knew that MSK was kind of coming up for you at some point. Yeah. What what was the decision you made or what, what led you towards the MSK role? Was it just something popped up on NHS jobs or? 
Yeah, so I so obviously it was a I rotated onto MSK, so I leveraged that. So yeah. it's more of an internal thing where uh, no, it could, have, it could have just been that I rolled up on on that, and that's what came up. I could, yeah. I could have got that, but it was just I remember trying to leverage my it. supervisions and stuff, and I just knew that that's what I fancied. So the sooner I could do that, the better, just because I knew that. Um, if I did too too many rotations just well outside of what was the centre of my interest, and I mm -hmm. felt like I'd come out of uni uh, further ahead than many of my peers from my placements, my elective placement, um, just having a lot of experience that I didn't want to lose uh, in MSK. So when I got onto MSK, I did my first rotation. Cannot believe me luck as to who was in that department and the sort of atmosphere. Oh, really? Uh, go back to that if you want. Probably mm -hmm. that would get a bit nerdy and too physical after <laughs> this show, but... but um, but from there, I just got this ridiculously useful MSK education that further enhanced it. And so I was then able to throw my hat in the ring on some jobs that came up in some interesting trusts, including back up in Nottingham, mm -hmm. um, which were MSK band five jobs and was able to throw my hat in the ring sooner than I might have done otherwise. Right To specialise in MSK at that point, especially in the jobs market, starting to lift out of it, but still pretty intense. Yeah. I was able to get in the mixer and fancy myself at interview as, a, as an MSK specialist so really sooner than, than people might have thought. But yeah, again, some good luck and some good judgment there that, yeah. you know, that I, I was ready for it, I thought. I think it's so important, like you said, to have someone like that who's a good mentor. And if without that person, like you say, you might never have had the experience to get that job. So... I think, especially for me and you at the moment, and probably for you, but obviously in the different industry, like you do need that person, I feel like, to give you a bit more um, for like, because there's so many times you, people just turn up to work and they just leave as soon as they can and they don't really care about what they're doing. They're just there because they know that they need to pay the bills. But there's that, there are those people, like you say, for you who might have been like, this is like, this is more interesting than just a job it's this you're going to learn something here and you're going to progress and and then yeah. that kind of ignited a fire in you i guess yeah obviously i've i've, I've followed where i can uh, to what you guys have been, been up to with this and you've been up front about the fact that you're wanting to try and broaden your horizons and understand yeah and and, and further you know ambitiously chase what are goals that are beyond uh, the narrow usual track of what yeah. training might unload un 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 for you and i love that but i know that it's you're right, it does sometimes take for uh, opportunities to present themselves and that is often in the form of, of mentors that can, that can yeah. guide that process and for you to learning how to uh, make it worth people's while. Um, and I know that you, you probably had opportunities in other walks of life and you might be doing it now, is, is offering that and, and, and making sure that no one pulls the ladder up behind them. Mm -hmm. So when you find people that are, are willing to give that and that you can match their generosity with your own enthusiasm and stuff and, and, and that is... It's, it's huge and, and that is a real accelerant to anyone's career and that um, done badly that is sort of finding someone that you can be sycophantic and bag carry for mm. and, and just yeah. end up just just being there nodding dog and just hoping that they can maybe give you some some um, you know a, a, a bonus or a leg up and and that can be you know a, a, a weird way of going about things yeah. but you're not actually developing any direct skill you're not really learning from them you're just you're just hoping that you they like you because you're just patting them on the back and telling them how good they are but if you're done properly um yeah. that relationship can be leveraged for you to really ask ask the silly questions but in or or to just disagree but in, in ways that they, they know that that's in the spirit of interest yeah um, and and to really guide that process and, and really for me especially at that time i was just a massive nerd for pain and injury like, yeah it's like and i still am i mean you guys have worked a bit around what we were doing and um and we are just massively passionate about it and that at the time presented itself as just mad curiosity yeah you know because i didn't have didn't have anything apart from just an intrigue and so you just you're just the guy mm, yeah if they'll, if they'll spend an extra five minutes after hours before they go and get on the bike to go home and stuff you know well, what's that about was it yeah and they'll signpost you to the what literature or resources or whatever or yeah. even say oh sod it go on i'll take my yeah. bike helmet off and ask you sodding questions jack for a bit you know yeah because if they're willing to uh and you're doing it with the for the right reasons then yeah that can uh, really open your mind and 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 they Opportunities present themselves. You really, that's how you make your own look. You really do. You yeah. Know, you, and you develop a skill set. You're not doing it just to, to network. Right? Yeah. You hear about it in other, in other industries and stuff where that really is just schmoozing, being in the right bars, talking to the right people yeah. and stuff. And mm -hmm. there's some of that. Everyone's doing a bit of that. But if you're simultaneously then properly sharpening yourself, you know, developing an expertise, you're actually becoming really credible and decent at, at yeah. the thing. 
um, then then that's a that's a, to, you know, there's a track you've got something more to offer the yeah. market, you know, to 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 leverage. I think what I, I gather from that as well is it's so important to be interested in the thing you're doing and kind of want to learn more because mm. if you don't have that and you've got people around you going, oh, why don't you get a promotion? Or why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? If if you haven't got that fire inside to want to learn more or you're not interested in it as much as the other people around you, then there are going to be people like yourself who kind of wanted to know more. Why is that person in pain? How can I help them? What's going to be the new treatments that are out there? Um, and it's the same for any job. It's the same for you as well, I think, when now have you started your own business in, in social media and it's, am I just doing this because I want to start a business or am I actually interested in social media and creating content and providing some sort of benefit for someone else? And you, you have to have that, I think, because otherwise like you say, it's, it can just die quite quickly. And it's, even with this podcast, I think we've had moments where we've sat down and gone, do we actually like film podcasts? Or are we just doing it because it's something to do? <laughs> and sometimes it can feel like that, but then you still remember why you do it and you still kind of like, yeah, I do actually really enjoy doing this and having the conversations with people and learning things and getting to meet new people. Um, so I think that's probably why, especially for yourself in, in the MSK industry, you, you were able to kind of just fly up because you might have had the good mentors but you also really wanted to learn and you also really were willing to kind of ask those questions that other people might not have yeah you never know do you as to there's never a there's never a parallel track that that you can witness you know what would it would have been like if ever it was different yeah and i often say I, and I, I can't i can't i still can't believe my luck as to who was in that department and who was willing to give the time at, the, at a time when yeah. i was like what else have i to do here right? i mean i'm in i'm in margate i'm making sun baits and stuff <laughs> I've, got, and I've got a gym to go to and, and go for a run but fundamentally if everyone else is clocking off at five and someone are going off to, you know, to, to, to their families and stuff and they've grown up locally or whatever it might be and i'm i'm in the sort of uh hospital digs and they're into night out plan for another few days at least, right? And, and so I'm just like, well, of course I can delay going at gym for half an hour if you're willing to spend 25 yeah. minutes with me talking yeah. about knee pain. Then, uh, you know, so the opportunity was there yeah. for me at that time in my life uh, for me to sort of nerd out with someone and to, and to pull on their shirt and ask some questions. But I said years later to, to, to um, who I'm on about particularly that I'm thinking about, and it, it's that that... I said, like, I cannot believe my luck. And he said, but how many, how many students and band fives I've had over the years and stuff, but none of them have started Physio Matters. None of them have started yeah. what is now a massive physio podcast. None of them have, you know, you still had to go and do the thing. You had to grab what I taught you as well as what other things you brought together and then leverage that. And to You were still still something yeah. about what you did. And I'll take that, you know, because I was, I was happy to choke most of it up to look. And yeah. I still can choke most of it up to look. But to some extent, there is plenty of other people that had come through there um, that, that, that hadn't. And I, so, you know, I think you, you were onto something there is that it's got to be a bit of both and you've got to just match people's interests. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just, you're always surprised at how, how generous people I'm, will be. I'm quite interested because there, there would have been people at that time, especially in 2013 or whenever it was, you started the podcast that were probably interested as you were, but they were just reading a book. They weren't thinking about starting a podcast, especially because sure. they weren't that big at the time. What what was it that kind of, in your mind, was wanted to start a podcast? Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because yeah, I, I met someone the other day that doesn't have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was on a bus. I know. I was like, what's your podcast called? <laughs> I don't, I don't have one. one. It's, like, <laughs> it's like finding someone that's not got an email address. I know. You know, what on earth? Um, but yeah, they turn a penny now, aren't they? It's funny. Uh, why did I start a podcast? And the, the story goes really is that I, I was working in Nottingham and uh, we, we still in the NHS at that time. Yeah, but it was a social enterprise, which was interesting. So it's commissioned to do NHS work. And that might seem right. like it makes no difference because it was all <coughs> NHS patients. But it's relevant is that you've got a bit more entrepreneurship in that middle space. Yeah. So it's not the private sector. It's not the public sector, but it's a, a social enterprise that's commissioned solely for NHS work. And, and so there's some really innovative factors and some innovative people around that service at the time. And so really worth traveling for, as I then, you know, made the mistake whilst down in Margate, falling in love with one of my best mates from uni who got a job <laughs> in Grimsby, right? It made no sense, most inconvenient thing in the world. Um, and so we eventually, then she's back, she's in Grimsby, I get to Nottingham, so we're a bit close together. Um, and then we got a flat in Sheffield and commuted then between Nottingham and Manchester. So she got wow. a job at Royal Manchester Children's and I was in... Uh, in Nottingham, so we we so I'm I'm driving an hour south. She's getting a train an hour and a half. A lot west. of commuting, yeah, a lot of commuting. 
Well, a podcast. I get a new <laughs> iPhone app, right? Upload it, and there's this purple thing. It says podcast on it. So I'll have a bit of that because I'm getting sick of Chris Miles or whatever. <laughs> so I click on this podcast app, and I wonder, and I just type in physio. And, uh, and I listen to this show, early physio podcast. The, 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 the godfather of physio podcast, really, you could say. He's an Aussie bloke called David Pope. Right? Fair play to David Pope. He'd only got maybe half a dozen shows at that point as, as episodes. I don't think he was doing monthly or anything like that. And he's still got a podcast. I don't know if he still does it, but he's got a big mm-hmm. CPD business over in Australia. And I listened to a show on the way on the way down there, and I couldn't believe it. I had to keep refreshing my app, and I was checking my bank account because I thought, how have I not paid for this? Yeah. So how <laughs> it's some because it's a new app, and I genuinely thought it's like, well, is it on my Apple Pay? Or not Apple Pay at that point, but I'm just feeling <laughs> like I could, I, mad. I just thought I must have paid for it because it was just like one of the best physio courses I'd been on yeah. in my ear for an hour and twenty minutes on the way to work. Couldn't believe it. Yeah. And then on the way home. I watched it. I listened to the next episode hurriedly. You know, it's it funny that I didn't get one in lunchtime. Or yeah. so. I couldn't believe it. But anyway, on my way home, um, even longer journey, I think, got stuck in traffic and I'm listening to another podcast. Anyway, I came back on the other podcast and I got home really irritated because it turned out that the podcast that I really enjoyed on the way down is because it was a really decent, credible therapist that he was interviewing and on the way home it was a bit of a cowboy oh no and, t- and, and so no fault of david really at this point because early podcasting he's just administrating interviews he wasn't challenging them and he just on the way down you've got really credible phd level scientists talking about lateral hip pain in that instance on the way up it was someone that's spouting what to my taste at that point and still to this day was nonsense but he was <laughs> it's not his style to challenge or to offer any, what about this? Or that makes sense. Or how do you square this circle? Or like, yeah. how does that play out in practice? Like, we don't see that. And just, again, not, just not his style. So I then came home and, you won't believe this. Look at this. I'm still checking whether I've paid for these things. Right? So I show, I show, the, I show my now wife um, this and, and, and said, like, fair play. I got to work and I was a better therapist for it. Couldn't believe it. Got back and I'm just like, it turns out it's massive um, toss of a coin as to whether or not the credibility of the guest yeah. really mattered, you know, yeah. because the, 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 the host didn't really do that and stuff. And what he should have done if it was being journalistic about it, right? I'm thinking like, uh, like I used to about journalism. And she said, well, could you do better? I said, yeah. <laughs> So we had just started a consultation business called Choose Health, doing second opinion work for sports teams in the area to help junior therapists that were quite isolated because they were just trying to get jobs anywhere, I remember, at this point. Yeah. Quite isolated, working in semi-pro teams and stuff like that. It's still very isolating now. I don't know if you guys do any of that. Or you've got mates that probably will, and they're mm-hmm. kind of blagging it, putting wet fingers in the air, trying to guess what the hell ligaments blown out. Yeah. <laughs> when it could be their career on the line, and they're just like, uh, uh, I think it's your... Uh, no, X, few people XC- like I that. think you've blown Jump. your XCL. Uh, <laughs> and, and so when they do something like that, we were setting up a consultation service where we'd go in and, you know, early biopsychosocial stuff where I'm going talking to the, 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 the player, the therapist, the coach, you know, talking talk to the board of directors if I needed to. Just yeah. just, oh, man, I'm a mercenary. I'll go and, co- you know, confront who you need to for what is in the best interest of this player. If they, It's a semi-pro rugby team. They've not got a lot of money. But if their number 10's not on the pitch and they're about to pay 600 quid for an MRI, which is what it cost at the time, then they'd, better, they'd pay me... 200 quid to go and problem solve that for a few hours. Now, that's good money at that point. It's yeah. good money at any, any point. Right? But what I mean is, compared to, um, you know, off the, off the shelf, um, say, if we're working in private practice or something, yeah. you're going to get a chargeable rate at that. Now, it's sporadic work. You're not going to find 10 clubs that will have you on one Saturday morning. That's yeah. hellish money. But anyway, that's what we're doing. It's novel second opinion work. The reason I mention that is because how were we going to... A lot of the referrers for that really early service were interprofessional referrals Mm. because you had a vulnerable, lonely junior therapist that was feeling isolated but also put on by the coaches, staff or whatever. How were they going to know about us? So when she said, could you do better? And then I joined the dots and thought, well, I can't afford to go on these courses, I fancy. I don't want to talk to these experts. So maybe they'd come on this interview show because no one's doing it in the UK at least. It could help us get a name out there as a second opinion consultancy. So if we sort of leverage a reputation so that other therapists, four other therapists, and I ask the right questions because it's my bread and butter in terms of like, I'll ask the questions of these experts that I'm seeing in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. And so it just felt like there were a few reasons to make it worthwhile. And so the... It never occurred to me how awkward it would be. I didn't know what an RSS feed was at the time, which is what you had to set up. You just didn't yeah. have services that would do it now and stuff. And 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 so it was it was awkward, 
But um, and we we had st- struck. So me and me and Charlotte threw hundred quid in a piece, and that was going to get us a website um, and um, and a couple of microphones that I found on eBay for a bargain. <laughs> And and then I was sharing I was sharing an eBay account with my dad still at that point. <laughs> to which he then went, What's this that you're buying these microphones in Germany for? He's like, This is weird. And I told him, I said, This is what's happened. It's a funny one, but I'm just gonna give this a whirl. He went, Well, I'll spot you that. Yeah. And it's useful because that meant our oh, 200 quid stretch further, because 90 quid of it at least, I think, I can't remember, but 90 quid we're gonna go on these microphones. Um and um and so it was it's funny because it was so so primitive, podcasts were so primitive that then then it became how do you how do you even you had to explain what a podcast was yeah. prior to then persuading someone to come on as a guest mm. and then you knew that this was definitely going to fail on the caliber of the guest that's why I'm judging you for having me right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the only way that my podcast worked is because I was somehow able in that novelty to persuade some actual decent thinkers and experts like <laughs> but and, and 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 I think that that's where it was such a weird set of events that that led to it but again. You just you do do the thing, you know. Yeah. Do the reps, yeah. you know, and, and, it, and it comes so, together. So obviously, we 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 joke about the person on the bus. If you don't have a podcast, what are you doing? <laughs> obviously, ten years ago, as you as you say, obviously it wasn't as big of a thing. Okay, it's new to the scene. What were sort of people's initial thoughts of you setting up a podcast? Obviously, you say you say your dad was pretty pretty on board with it. Sure. Um, what what were people's thoughts? Did you think, oh, should I? I'm a bit nervous about giving this a go. Obviously, no one's no one you know has really done it before. It's not really, as you say, in the UK, it wasn't something that people people were doing. Yeah. Did you have second thoughts about it, or was it something that, especially coming from your, was it you a, a, you wanted to go into journalism? Obviously, you wanted to get your your words out there, your writing out there. Is it something you think actually it just fell naturally? It's something you wanted to do. It's a good question. I've not really thought about those times where I felt about it. I, I really knew that. I don't half ask things, so it was it was always that you were going to... There was no way I wasn't going to do 10. 10 do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like something like that. So it was always worth giving a go. And then once, I, once I'd done a couple and I'd run it by a few people and stuff like that, and also I'm a continue to be a curious kid and like I, I knew that that is relevant like the, the question marks in a, in a gray area of pain and injury and stuff there's no, not much of it is settled so curiosity is a hell of a superpower so mm-hmm. I kind of knew that there was something in that and then as long as I could get the technical product tolerable which is all it was now if you listen back to some of those early shows and stuff and we were known for being high, you know really good sound levels all sorts of stupid compliments we were being paid when which which we didn't deserve compared to today's standards of course and we had people st- i couldn't afford mic stands because we just got these microphones but handheld felt and looked stupid and awkward because it was strange <laughs> enough people to be talking or, in, or being interviewed or anything like yeah. that and so that felt strange so i borrowed my a wife's a, a family are really musical. So I had people straddle an actual mic stand, <laughs> which somehow was less, they really heavy as well, these things, and straddle this mic stand in, in the front room. And again, they tolerated all of this. It was brilliant. Um, and, and, and so if, if, if the podcast went well, they stood up and just pole danced on it. <laughs> I, stopped, I, stopped, I stopped short of that. I stopped short of that. But it was just, yeah, awkward, just clunky, but it, you know, it, it, worked. it worked. Yeah, just plugging these things so straight, into a, straight into a laptop and cross your fingers that it records and, and have you got enough storage on this thing? So it, it, it's more that you, you can't help but think about those times in, in, in you just, if you're going to do the thing, you, you, I could never have concerned myself too much and I'm also someone that fortunately just could not give a monkey's what people thought about it at the time, yeah. much like I don't now. Like, it was very <laughs> it's easy for me to do that. I'm yeah, just best not, way to be. I, it, well, it's just also just, it, that, that admittedly is just, I cannot take any credit for that because I, I just I just don't I don't care I, I yeah. just can't be I'm, I, it's not possible for me to be self conscious I've just I've never been <laughs> to a fault to some extent like there's mistakes you make as a as a kid growing up of which it's just like if you if you can't feel shame or embarrassment you're gonna be do stuff that is just stupid mm-hmm. like not super careless but I mean like yeah, you know, it's a useful emotion sometimes, embarrassment, to stop, stop you doing proper daft things, especially on the beer at university. <laughs> I'm just meaning that in that moment, what a benefit, because yeah. I really didn't mind. Now, how did people respond to it? It's funny because friends and family are just like, well, talk for England, that lad, put him up, put him on a microphone, it couldn't go wrong. If they, don't <laughs> like it, they don't like it, but it's not, it's not as if they were like, oh, if, if, that's, if that crashes and burns, he'll never get over it. They were never going to be worried about me like that. Yeah. And so it was just like, why not give it a whirl? And then, but the biggest and most interesting thing which still arguably plays out to this day is interprofessionally and intraprofessionally that's probably the better way of putting it is that who's this 
And what does he think he's doing? Mm. What gives him any credit right to do that? Now, running it as an interview show and saying I'm putting the microphone under actual experts and stuff like that and leveraging it for questions is, is, is reasonable. But certainly the style in which I was doing it, where you've got an eminent professor across from you and you're just saying, so there's a research group in Spain that, that fundamentally disagrees with your theories and, on anterior knee pain. And, you know, might they have a point? Right, and I don't think I, I think hopefully my question was slightly better than that. <laughs> but I'm just meaning that you, you're being a bit confrontational. How yeah. are you trying to word it? And I wasn't giving it like doth my cap to the professor. I'm not that sort of guy. Right? Yeah. I, 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 I'd, I'd be happy. He's, he's a bit poorly at the moment, but if King Charles were in here, like I really wouldn't give a monkey's right yeah. as to the difference. You know, I just can't really behave that. It's another thing I just don't do. And so essentially, I was always appropriate and professional, and respectful. I hope, but fundamentally, I wasn't phoning over said yeah. professors and therefore I was just talking to them as if to say how would you justify that opinion much like he might have done they might have done me yeah and um and so I think that that meant that and still to this day there's people that still judge me by some of that as to how dare he he hasn't served his he hasn't served the right course and at that point you just and I didn't realize at the time just how it was an accidental revolution in that at that point um you went on CPD courses, but even that was a little bit uncouth compared to going and doing your masters or other appropriate credential things at the universities. And if you really wanted to even think about research, literature, academic type stuff, then you needed to earn it mm -hmm. by gaining specific credentials or working under various eminent researchers. And I was just putting them on a podcast and spending time with them. And there were people that had killed for an audience with or to call yeah. with someone. And I was just sort of, sort of, it felt like I was cheating. And I think that that was something that did go down badly in some circles. And I think arguably there's some that still judge me for that. I think eventually in time, it wasn't something that I was doing for a couple of years just as a means of making a bit of a name or being controversial or something. So once I've stuck around, there's fewer people I hope that, that feel that way. And I think yeah. I've justified what I've done, but mm. it's definitely was a, a, a big thing that I think most people from what I understand would never have put up with some of the sort of uh, yeah, sort of slanderous or yeah. personalised sort of uh, trying to bring me down a peg or two type things. But, if, you know, again, just brash, northern, lanky gobshire. Yeah. It's like really <laughs> I guess straightforward yeah. to push back against. It's not a bad personality trait to have then, and it's kind of, it must have worked to some extent then. You managed to speak to, <laughs> must manage to speak to that many people and uh, they're still, you still get guests on. It at, does, yeah. No. At what sort of point did you realise actually this is, it's getting out to the people I want it to get out to. It's, it's making sort of, it's getting numbers. Because it, I, I, I mean, I'm not going to assume, I can't assume that you would have carried it on forever if it wasn't going, if it wasn't going to get the audience that, the, and this is that where it I have, deserves. I have so much sympathy for, sympathy is the wrong word, you know, like it's, it's too close to pity almost. Yeah. It's not that, but it's just that the situation now with how mm. congested it is mm. and stuff is that, um, and it's the, it's the uh, you'll have seen it, won't you? The, the sort of Gary V thing is just yeah. make the content, just yeah. do the thing, <laughs> learning it, right? And I get it, but, but can you believe it? Within within a few months, I'm getting thousands because, and, and 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 I'm getting thousands on something that isn't a thing yet. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So people people are downloading a podcast app just to listen to Physio Max because they've heard it in a staff room. What's a podcast? Oh, it's yeah. a radio show. Do, am I paying for this? No. Why wouldn't right. I? Very Listen accessible. Yeah. It's super accessible, and, and it's just the only show in town. And so yeah. we leveraged that for years because it was just that people had a radio show in common. Yeah, they did one a month, well, fairly you know well put together. I'd argue and stuff. And then the the story is that we we did a hundred consecutive months of that format of the interview, the one to one, mm -hmm. one to two type interview that was not heavily produced, but an, an edited podcast just once a month. And um, and that was prolific content building back yeah. then. You know, you, you, that that wouldn't be now. And and also what you're competing with. So it was quite quick. You know, and, and I, that is, I can't be blessings really that I had that feedback yeah. directly. Now it might have been that they half of them hated it. They, 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 I think we did better than that for ratios in terms of positive feedback. And also that they, there was something in it for the guests then. Yeah. You know, some of those. Um, some of those early podcasts really launched some people. I think it's careers. admirable. I think it's admirable because you've obviously done something new at a time when found your niche. Yeah, at a time when it wasn't the normal thing. I mean, obviously, podcasts now, as we've said, everyone's doing it, so it feels less 
special. I guess. Less special, yeah. so it feels like more a normal thing to be doing. But I think, yeah, it's 100%. It's like you more. starting like something random now that's just a new new trend. Yeah, and then in 10 years, it being like the big one of the biggest things yeah. what people listen to on the on their daily commute. So yeah. it's 100%. Since, it's a funny one. I mean, how old were you guys 10 years ago? 20, yeah, no, four, 14. 14. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was 15. I was, See, I was, no, the, I was the first listener. The, but it's more than, like, <laughs> it's more than um, just around that time, it's just Ricky Gervais had just started the Ricky Gervais show as a podcast and stuff like that, yeah. interviewing Carl Pilkington. Oh, it's hilarious. just a funny time yeah. Yeah. for uh, podcasting was just starting to creep in. Certainly not the interview show for sort of science and what have you. Yeah. But I'm just meaning that, like, I cannot pretend to have really, like, like, smelt something on the wind and just been like so <laughs> intuitive like it, it, it's a good set of coincidences but at that time someone was going to do it and, and then it was just a case of can you do it well um and so this it's been really fun over the years people have come and gone and, and, and continued to and, and good on them but it's just that and there is some, still something to be said for them then it's about the it's about the quality it's the, it's the usp and all yeah. the other stuff but it's just that um you know i i I love I love shiny new things. It's one of the problems in a way, and it's one of the things that's nice for me to now have stuff that's uh, that's got a appropriate time frame of a of a of a legacy of a sorts, and that we were able to move something. We actually retired that format of a show technically after a hundred consecutive episodes mm -hmm. and stuff, and so then we move on to other other things and spin offs and stuff. But at the heart of it, then you have got a an audience and and a sort of media business alongside your healthcare stuff and so you're not then just selling your labor to help people with their sorbets and so the the people that i've helped hopefully is beyond the people yeah. i've ever seen as a clinician was yeah i was going to say that was there any a point where you thought instead of being a clinician yourself and doing the actual physio hands-on seeing patients where you were just going to do the, the talking to the experts and get gathering evidence and sharing that yeah i think i've i've um i'm an, enough of a generalist really to to want to always do a little bit of everything, you know, and, and also um, there's been times in my career where I've been, you know, lean far more onto, especially early days of physiomatics, you're 90 plus percent clinical because it's just yeah. one, once a month I go and do a recording, learn how to edit the thing and stuff like that. So it's not a large part of your job then. You're doing some promotional stuff, but even then that's straightforward because you one of 12 accounts posting tweets. So again, I'm just fortunate to be a vaguely larger fish in a small pond at that point. But um, in time, COVID's a good example of this, terrible time to be in clinical practice, especially in private practice when they're about to literally close you. Yeah. yeah. And a good time to be in digital education. Yeah. Right? So the ability is one example for me to flex and have a diverse business portfolio, right? So you've just got that ability to then... What a ridiculous circumstance you couldn't have seen coming, but I was able to try and keep the lights on by leaning into that. And so there's times where I've then done lots of that and nothing clinically apart from sort of current second opinion stuff amongst my team once we had a practice. But I was doing very little clinical for a bit and I didn't like that either. Mm -hmm. Main thing I realised with that, because I had to wonder, because there were a lot of people, and, and including my accountant, that would rather I just didn't sell my labour for an hour to patients, right? Because it's not effective now compared to what I'm sought after for, or what I could consult for, or how I could mentor staff to then work for me. And and so all the pressures, uh, rational commercial pressures would, would suggest that you, you just wouldn't do that. And you know, mm. just get over yourself and don't see patients anymore and teach people to see patients. Or don't worry, you're making a difference by people listening to your show and mm -hmm. your events and they're seeing patients. You're still helping people that way. But I talk so much, as you're noticing in probably this interview and, and, and others, is that it's the easiest thing for people to accuse me of is being all talk. So the ability for me to talk about best practice on back pain and then deliver it the next day with someone or so someone to say, that's a good idea. I'm going to send my auntie. She's, she's always struggled with her back. And I'm just like, bring it on. So put it in the waiting room. I, I'm, I'll, I'll act on that. And so to, to have that and to not just be talking a good game in theory, but then to apply it in practice. Or we come up with innovative models in which you know, MSK practice should be more community centered and you should do more social prescribing interventions to actually get people moving and, and mm. decenter, de medicalize mm. it. People say, that's a nice idea, but how do you do it? Right, I'll show you. Yeah. So you're having that hand in on the practical application of it mm. um, is another, another useful thing for me is that, um, not because I've got anything to prove, but certainly to myself, is that you, you, convince, you convince yourself of all sorts of stuff. You know, if I, if I went too far that way and just became an online educator and stuff, it would be too theoretic. Yeah. If I was too close to it in, in the weeds all the time, then I'd be frustrated about the postcode lottery that I was naturally creating or the yeah. fact that it's not, it's not, it's a shame that I wouldn't be able to share this. Or if I get a chance to 
uh, interview someone, then why wouldn't I want to broadcast it yeah. or something? So, you know, it's I'm, weirdly, I take, take Zoom calls with people and I had one this morning that I was like, we should have recorded that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, well, I feel selfish almost because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it was a brilliant conversation and I want to broadcast it. So I, I've always tried to find that balance. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily make rational commercial sense all the time, but it certainly helps me sleep at night. And it yeah. definitely means that I, I, it goes back to what you were saying about like, what really fuels your passion has ended up being for me trying to find some way to get a balance between all those things and we just scratch the various itches that yeah. can make me me and and also they're the things that make you unique as well mm -hmm. i've noticed it's this idea of sort of a talent stack where it's like there's nothing that we're describing or nothing special about the yeah. like individual thing but the uniqueness comes from that combination of things that make it a bit a bit more unique is because it's, it's a rarer thing when they accumulate yeah what, what i'm quite interested in is because obviously now you own your own uh, clinic as well as having your online stuff <laughs> What was it that made you go from being an NHS physio to then start your own a business, I guess, and, and run your own clinic? Just before COVID, yeah, stupidity. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I so as I, as I described, I always had this second opinion stuff going on yeah. with yourself. I think I've had as much ambition to be a, um, a businessman as I have to, to be a physio. And funny businessman, because entrepreneur is a better way of describing me, really, because even when I was working for other people, it was always, they call it intrapreneurship now. Have you heard that? Before? Yeah. And, and it's a very, very useful term, um, whether it's a necessary term you know, rather than just, you know, doing your job sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, hilarious, really, isn't it, that? But, you know, I was thinking creatively about solving problems, and we do that as, as physios, not s only physios, but, you know, we, we, we kind of have to do that, the grey areas that I talked about. Mm -hmm. And so I've um, I've always... I think it was, it was then that the constraints of the system, if you were trying to innovate, were always going to be challenging. And if you also had this opportunity where you really felt like you wanted to to carve your own path and you fancied running things yourself and we had this business that was that was growing on a second opinion level once we put some roots down and we knew where we wanted to live and we bought a house and all that sort of stuff then it's not a sensible model to to go out to people rather than bringing them to you and these people can't can i come to your facility and stuff and i'm yeah. busy saying that when when it used to be um a sports club Right, that made sense. Even if they didn't have a couch, I could bring that. And uh, but when when it was just like people coming in and you're getting second opinion referrals and stuff for people, I'm like, well, can I come to you? You don't. I don't want to go to your house. I'm not domiciliary community physio and yeah. stuff. But then it made no sense. I was going to people's offices and, I going, and so they didn't have a sports facility because that's where it started. It, it, my model started to not break down, but it was just a victim of its own success. Is that yeah. I don't want to be really couching a bit of a car, especially as a as a sort of rehab, functional rehab type stuff. Meant that I, I wanted somewhere that was beyond. Do you feel that that small. was a sacrifice you had to make though? Obviously to to come and to, to get your name out there to get the clientele to then yeah. be able well, yeah, to have your own place you massively massively so it's something you have to do and, and but at that point and most people would then just be like so you get a room off the side of a gym or a hairdressers and stuff like that and that's what you do is you've just got to find something that is less of a compromise so people can come to you but you've then got you've then got a massive compromise space so when we set up our own that was that was just us taking the plunge just to say um we need to control enough of these variables. Like it needs to, it needs to not be in the far corner of a gym that you don't like. I mean, I guess yeah. there's, there's probably been quite quite a lot of people who have gone out, bought these these hired out these massive places, bought all this mass loads of really expensive equipment, had all the gear, but doesn't have the clientele. So you can't sit there and wait, can you? You've got to go out and find it first, I guess, before you then expand and. Yeah, well, I, I very nearly made that mistake though, right. especially because of when COVID came. So you know, that's the thing is that normally you would build up. I suppose the confidence come arrogance so what we did is that we did what you shouldn't do which is build it and they will come and that doesn't work because we had no client base locally right so right. all the reputation that we had a lot of it from Sheffield worldwide. Nottingham and then well yeah interprofessionally we had this worldwide yeah. but it was a local patients that like you need you're not going to you're not going to run a clinic you've seen it it's not the smallest it's not the largest but it's not the smallest clinic that yeah. we have you're not going to run that off complex second opinion work referred by just your colleagues yeah. especially because many of those colleagues will at least have a go and see them a few times for, for they'll take their money a few times yeah. before they want to refer them and it's only when they really get ahead 
head scratched at the ascendant. You can't run a yeah. business off that, especially once you've got bills to pay. <laughs> yeah. so you need to see ankle sprains and sore backs off the street. Yeah. That don't know you from Adam. And it's useful as well that you don't want to be the, the, that guy all the time. So you just people coming in because they, they Googled it, right? So in that regard, it was stupid, but I knew that because we had this other thing, we put a radio studio in the sod in practice and that we've got other other irons in the fire commercially that meant I've got a bit more of a timeline. I can build it up slowly over 12 months and still be able to pay the rent. That's what we decided. But little, I'd have put my foot down harder on that if I knew there was a pandemic coming. Do you see what I mean? So mm -hmm. we were quieter than we should have been when we had to close the thing. We had to start again pretty much from scratch once yeah. it reopened. So... That's where you should, you know, if anyone's listening and not just physio business, but yeah, you, you just, you can't be complacent on that. Now, little did I know, of course, that we're a pandemic coming and here we are and we managed to survive it. But as a general rule, you, you could never afford to have the overheads that we, we had if you didn't have other, other income streams yeah. uh, because you, you do need to build that up. And you almost want to be um, really bursting out at the top of your facility or, or your circumstances, right, yeah. before you then really do something big, unless it's with someone else's money, which is another model. I, I often thought, <coughs> admittedly, it's not for me. You know, I, I've, I've, I just find I've watched too many people uh, that, that, that spend other people's money badly, yeah. uh, in, including in business, you know. So I have, I'm sort of a bootstrap story, but it's not for everyone. And that's one way of doing it is that you just spend someone else's money or some obscure banker then just sort of lends you some and then you go for it and you build it. And now, now and again, it works. But no, it wasn't for me, especially not in healthcare. And you, go on. I was going to say, it's a bit of a different question. More physio related, I guess. You might not be able to answer. You might be able to answer it. But what makes someone a good physio, in your opinion? Yeah, um, I think really a, a good physio these days is someone that would center someone's functional rehabilitation needs over anything else. And mm -hmm. you think that anyone would do that. Is that not just physio generally? Yeah. Well, no, actually, some people would immediately see, well, what things do I need to correct? Or what um, diagnosis do I need to reverse, really? Um, and that is a very different model. So I think a good, a good physio across disciplines, even beyond pain and injury, mm -hmm. would assess someone's needs based on their own functional goals, assess where they are, and scale them to where they want to get to. I'm forever using my hands. I can do this on a yeah. you have got three cameras. But I'm just meaning like, where, assess where they are according to them, not according to your priors, mm -hmm. and scale them to where they want to get to as long as that's a reasonable and realistic goal. That's good therapy. It's the, it's the bridge between those two yeah. things. I mentioned the word therapy rather than just physio, but if physio wants to be serious, it should focus on that. With a holistic approach rather than just treating a, a problem that you well, see. That's the thing is that the, 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 thorough, the thorough assessment of that individual is naturally holistic because those you, challenges are unique. You said earlier, obviously, um, I bet you, or you said, um, can you treat my nan with back pain? Someone comes to you and you said, oh, I'll make a podcast on it about treating lower back pain without the hands-on approach, that sort of thing. Is that why, obviously, you, you run, it's becoming more and more successful. I'm following it online, that Simply Sports Club, okay? And you're getting loads and loads of and the Trundle. older generation, the, the Trundle Walk Group, to um, go out and increase their physical activity levels. So I yeah, think what that, inspired you is, to do that? Is that something that you're really passionate about because it's less of that hands-on approach and it's teaching people to treat things themselves? And, and that sort of that yeah, sort well, of it suits, it suits our, our philosophy in lots of ways. Got a lot of you f to thank you guys for that in some ways, haven't we? On that, on that first, <laughs> no, your, your viewers yeah. won't know. Um, and it's funny because Eddie, you, you might remember. Do you remember cringing as much as you? Oh, I still remember all yeah, that. Yeah, right? But yeah. that, I'm gonna I'm gonna make you blush again and make you cringe again <laughs> for talking a bit about that because it's something that it's that that early stage, right? That getting a couple of people and then being like there more, more, more therapists than people there. More, that's right. <laughs> so that, that process of just coming up with an idea, thinking that's a good scheme, but how do you market it? Mm. And then recognizing that like, right, I've got five therapists here, but two older people that are briefed <laughs> here. And then you end up doing something that the intervention feels out of skew. Yeah. Is that as long as if you're still doing that five months on something's gone wrong. But what I mean <laughs> is that that, that, that um, shamelessness, of just being like, oh, what's it, what's it matter? You know, who, who, who's around here judging this? Like, we're just doing so. It's the right idea. And it's more fool everyone that's not come. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's the right idea. <laughs> so we'll do it again. And we'll do it again and we'll market it better because it's the right idea. And you can be proud and we'll be enthusiastic about said marketing because it's the right idea. You know, I'm going on about it, but it's yeah. meaning that then 
are we trying to lift the fitness and therefore health of the community, especially an isolated and somewhat marginalised elderly community, especially after COVID, and just saying like, we would like, we think that you should maybe try walking with us once a week. And the safety that comes from us being physios and stuff, which I think is overplayed in some yeah. ways, but they really value that expertise. But, you know, it's safe to do that. Or the fact that they, you know, one of them a few weeks into doing it, they trip over a tree root and stuff and, and we, we didn't panic. I mean, we yeah. still, when, when they were first down in the water, you know, you, you kind of lift them out. <laughs> oh, no, 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 don't worry. But we, we, we oh. had some slips and trips and I'm just meaning that Outside of any, you're never going to have a dramatic first aid situation. You just, yeah. you just, it's all within a sense of risk assessment where it's like, oh yeah, this is challenging, and you are working at your own risk. We've done basic assessments and stuff of you, but you're all yeah. consenting adults. We're going for a walk, and he's not medically unstable, right? So you just buy. They match that confidence. Well, well, said it's all right. Maybe I could walk yeah. further than I thought, and so that that spirit of it and that community aspect meant it's, it escalated. So, yeah. we got, but we got two on the first week. The reason I'm uh, mentioning how that I remember that fun day that you guys did, yeah, and it was not dissimilar. Is that um, two of my staff? And funnily enough, I wasn't there for the first trundle, which is funny. But two two of my staff turned up and went for a walk, and two people turned up. But it went two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, and we've never had less than. 30 for last wow. year, right? It was exponential, and then it's held, yeah. and word of mouth got round there. And that's, they continued to say to us, and we got, you know, they had, they had a Christmas do with 65 of them. Wow. Right? It's just mad. It's just like a real lovely community now. And that process is more based on the fact that it's, it's that assessment of where you're not doing it as on an individual level at that level, but you are assessing the needs as accurately as you can of a demographic and then putting something together that will help them aspire to where they want to get to. They want to be more comfortable. They want to be more confident lifting their grandkids. They want to, they want to feel um, it's, it's winter now, but it's like spring's coming soon. I want to be more capable in the garden. Right, and so what? What that? What does that entail? So we're doing. We're teaching them about arthritis when they get back. They're having a having a brew drying off, and they're learning about back pain. They're learning about other things that that people otherwise have done to them, or they might go and need to see the doctor about, or they're trying to get him to persuade a pharmacist to tell them which Voltrol to use. Right? Why not teach them about that? And that yeah. that just you just test it, and if it works, it works. What's next? Is it with, with obviously the, the walking group, the Trundle Walking Group? Is it reaching out to other communities? Yeah, two things on that. One is that um, partly off the back of the relationship that we've built with them and we now sponsor the club and we um, have a deeper relationship with them. We've got various community schemes we want to do in partnership with them is that we're that moving the practice to that facility. So the groundsman's store is being converted wow. and we're going to turn it into what's going to be Timberley Health Hub. Oh, fantastic. We're have it as a, an MSK service, but then also we're going to put a perimeter track around that whole place so people can walk a buggy or that we can, you know, we'll put benches every hundred metres, right? Make it a, a rehab facility as well as a sports facility. So that's the, the sort of hyper-local, hot off the press, choose health news that will happen between March and June. We'll do it up and then open that in, in June time. That's so that's exciting. kind of what the business is going to be doing for that to leverage it. So we'll be able to treat any pain and injury and sports injuries and stuff, but then we'll also be able to do this. So Simply Sports Club will operate, we'll do pain and injury, and then we've got this third thing, community stuff. Then on the proliferation of it is that the, um, across the Physio Matters Network, people have been inquiring as to, might I do something similar? So there's a couple of pilots happening. There's one, a new trundle that's emerging in the Lake District, and there's one that's happening in Oxfordshire, and they're going to test that water, and we'll use them as pilots. And then, yeah, I just suppose what's the future? The future how, how of the National have, Trundle Service. Yeah. How do you have time to do all this stuff with two kids and a wife? <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose, yeah, the, the, the wife bit's the relevant bit in a sense that she would probably, she's hyper-efficient and hyper-effective, and she's absolute yin to the yang of both business and life. You know, yeah. like absolute partner in, in in everything and that's fortunate in, in all sorts of ways but also that massive um massive positive influence on on the business side yeah so, so my, my creativity her operational success and stuff like that um is is amazing so she will yeah she will make efficient what i just can't i, I can't keep a diary so she, <laughs> she will right and so that's one, one of the main things really and the, and the other thing is that um it's helpful that i again to, to a fault i just i don't I don't, and it's not something I'm saying that everyone else should be like, but I don't really want for money. Um, it's not, it's, 
I need to be smart sometimes, especially with a young family and that, where I, I sometimes do that to, to make, I do make a mistake, but just ha happen again, fortunately, to not be particularly material. And, and therefore, I'm just like, um, I want to, I really, I'm really bothered about, I can't believe the skill set I've developed that wants to lift healthcare standards in the, in the country and beyond. And so that is the centre of the bullseye. And then everything else just feels like you're just trying just to make that work. On, yeah. So how do I find the time for it? It's because... It, it's one of them where there isn't a work and play thing because it's just an oh, absolute one. passion, right? Some stuff you enjoy more than others. And I love to write my notes, right? <laughs> like, it's just like, you fundamentally have these things, things that you have to do. But as a general rule, um, aside from just committed family time and stuff like that when I've got the lads, which you just protect, and you can only do that through the independence that I have now. So yeah. my kids on it all day on Wednesday and then half day on Friday, right? I, I have technically really f malleable hours yeah. um, in, order to, in order to do that. How do you do it? you do it in that in my case through independence it'd be, be being able to work for myself and to have a uh, power over that diary yeah. um, and then uh, whether i take too much on that's still definitely me and i burn the candle at both ends sometimes <laughs> but as a general rule i managed to hopefully be clear enough with what the vision is and the the team around me and mm. particularly my, my business partner in charlotte and jack march yeah. as well who's a fantastic talent in in operations means that then i can they 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 let me be best I can be, but I definitely know my weaknesses yeah. and, and they can take those over. I was going to say, do you have any questions about like just running just a business? Mental. I feel like I just sit here and absorb everything every time, but <laughs> it's just, I feel like you talk down some of your skills and like situation as luck, but I feel like if you didn't put yourself out there in the first place, like you have or taken opportunities, it's even like the way you leverage certain things that might be different to your field, but you've applied it to your field. Like you could say that, with the podcast that someone's already done it, a lot of people look at it and go for every reason why they shouldn't do a podcast. Whereas yeah. I feel like you've looked at it and done every reason why you can do it better. And I feel like it's just, I don't know, a testament to why people should just try, try more stuff and believe in themselves a little bit. I feel like you'll just explain that and everything that you do. It's just uh, impressive. It's nice. I'm really glad you feel that way. And it's exciting what you guys are doing and, and you're doing with the, the new company and stuff, because I remember those things and I, I saw just uh, preparation for this yesterday i had a little look and stuff and, and, and love what you i just I'm, I'm, i have i look on at that and i'm just sort of jealous of the sorts of some of those embryonic times you know what's your first logo look like what, yeah. what yeah, are the yeah. color schemes things that by the way matter far less than yeah, you might think but, to start with but, anyway. <laughs> but that but i'd be disappointed if if someone that was your stage was being as cynical as I am about color schemes and logos, that would be wrong way around. You should you should be obsessing over that detail. You should be mm. bothered about that. Even though you'll go on to find it matters less than you realize you think now, but do what you can do at the time. You haven't got much in your purview at that point. And if you leverage that well, do it well, as I kept saying, like just do the thing, but do it well, yeah. um, then then it, it comes together. And if, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but you you don't want to, you don't want to regret half arse and stuff. And so I uh, look back really fondly at those times. I do think that the timing on lots of it, especially the podcasting stuff, I can't, it'd be, it'd be nonsense. If I was sat here saying, you know, like, Planned it out. oh yeah, just not, nothing but genius <laughs> all the way down. It'd be nonsense. Now, uh, you know, you, you're, uh, you're trying to balance and always looking on at your life and trying to work out what's been good luck and what's been good judgment and, and you don't know that you don't know mm -hmm. how good he is i do that constantly as a, a parent particularly a parent of twins you've got this living science experiment of identical twins uh, you know you're trying to work out what's nature what's nurture it's it's complicated but that curiosity is something you just apply to everything and i just don't see the spirit of rehabilitation and i think if i if i had conscious if i was conscientious enough to write a book it would be on the central metaphor of rehabilitation across society could we, we see could that? we see that one day, if I can ask <laughs> that was going to be one of my that's, questions. But that's the sort of thing that's stupid. Is that I don't. Um, it's uh, it's that some would argue, and a mentor of mine <clears> recently <throat> argued that if you were a bit more you know, commercially savvy or commercially ruthless or leveraged in advertising and stuff like that, then that's the sort of thing that means that you could go and have a right, you know, just take take a six months out to write said book because you'd have nothing else to do. Um, and but it's just a, a funny funny way of looking at things. So uh, I just think that the when we're talking about saying I'm in business and stuff. It's just that what, what are you doing? You've got to ex examine the market carefully and thoroughly, work out what the who's and ours are of it, and then try and scale it to what it needs to be to serve what it is your goals are, right? I've just described yeah. what to me. A bit of a change in topic, okay? Talk about failures, okay? Not every business, I guess, is 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 made up on success, success, sure, success, yeah. okay? I guess often there's more failures than there are success. Yeah. What would you say was the first failure you had, if, if you can remember, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. where you thought, oh, this isn't going to plan. 
Okay, maybe there wasn't one. Okay, and then what what would you say is maybe your your biggest failure that you you've you've, you've had to sort of endure? Yeah, the biggest the biggest one's probably easy, but the first one I can really remember is what we were starting up talking about. So uh, off the camera, the, the the lads were setting up and stuff, and just making sure that they pressed the right red button. And I, I reflected on losing losing one of the I think it was in episode six of Physio Matters, and incidentally one of the first sort of sponsored podcasts. We'd been given a couple hundred quid and been introduced to the guest and stuff, and we were doing this thing. And I turned up and. Um, you know, you've just about managed to scrounge a bit of time in the diary for this thing that was hardly a thing at the point. And you'd, I think we'd, you know, been months in the in the in the making, uh, uh, sending emails, of which I'm not strong at emails anyway at that point. <laughs> so I'm just like trying to coordinate it, and I lose the file. And so you then end up having to grovel and uh, and then take up an extra few hours of their time the next day driving back across <laughs> the Derbyshire on petrol money I couldn't afford. And, and so it was just that, the, that it's such a it's a minor failure of just a, like a, a tech failure, mm -hmm. but it had such high stakes at the time. And and that the easy thing to do would have been to just roll on that and to just not to not bother redoing it, I guess, yeah. or, to, or to have rescheduled for a few weeks' time or something like that. But once I realised that they knew I was genuine when I apologised. They were happy where the conversation had gone and I'd done a good job there for them yeah. to think, I'm disappointed that that's not going to be aired as well. It wasn't like they humoured me for an hour. They yeah. got something out of it and we got on all right. So they were willing to give me another chance. I went, I triple checked. I think I recorded it on four different devices. And, <laughs> and, and just and just then uh, that was a, an obvious failure that probably could have, it wouldn't have broken the whole thing, but certainly the consistency. Now I look on and we did 100 consecutive consecutive months of, of, of high caliber I'm really proud of every one of those shows we wouldn't have bought one out that month if I hadn't have gone back and done that yeah. you know what I mean would have yeah. been like oh they do physio matters is now and again rather than it being every month for the first Sunday of every month and we did that for 100 episodes so every 100 months and so that's one failure that definitely did it no the biggest one is that I was I leveraged all of my um all of my reputation I guess and <laughs> community building in 20 19 um, i spent pretty much the whole year any spare moment i had any spare change we had as a business any of the business profit went into setting up a non-profit uh, think tank um to try and raise msk care standards it's called msk reform um and we uh, spent a load of time and a load of money and we, we uh, presented a manifesto for reform in uk parliament we got a load of political support and loads of interest and i, I, I won't regret doing it but that got delivered in de November of 2019 and in parliament with my heavily pregnant wife with twins at the time, go off on, you know, she has the boys, I'm off for maternity leave. I get back to work on February, 2020, of which I then need to capitalize on that year, investing in what was going to be, of which then um, little did we know COVID was happening. But when COVID happened, it wasn't that I'd just been somewhat neglecting my clinical practice that was fairly new with the wet paint on the walls or that physio matters hadn't really been, I hadn't commercialized physio matters much then at that point. That was what I'd done with that is to lift the reputation for me to be this great reformer that was mm. going to do. And so I ended up doing something that now I look back on that you should do in the twilight of your career. You can see why sort of wrinkly old fellas will set up some philanthropic organization yeah. at the end of their careers is because they've got that security to do it. I wanted to do it whilst I had all this enthusiasm and impetus because I was just like, it's all, it's all going well. Little did I know that the world were going to collapse commercially. So that's a big regret because that really nearly killed us. I don't mean literally, although you could argue it. <laughs> but the, the 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 young kids in the pandemic, being yeah. in healthcare with a business that wasn't standing on its own feet at that point, with overheads, with not being legally allowed to open the doors of. So I had to innovate really big there, and we had to go. Me and Charlotte had to pull a rabbit out of the hat, which we called Therapy Live at the time, and uh, fortunately kept the lights on. But that was a failure that could well have killed us. And and unfortunate to have a career in which I could have fallen back and gone and worked for other people and stuff. But that's what I'd be doing. I'd probably still be that very came very close to me probably yeah. having to go and work for other people and I'd still be licking my wounds and talking about what, 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 could, <laughs> what have could have been, been. Uh, because that was a, and, and that that yeah it was, was still I'm, I'm still we're still as a business and as a person still recovering from that it was pretty pretty insane um and 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 I you're at risk then of almost over blaming COVID. Yeah. you know you don't want to be that guy that's always blaming COVID but it was just a, a series a perfect storm in, in lots of awkward ways, really. So I hope I hope that answers the question. That's yeah, a really, good, really good answer. Me, yeah. You've given me the shake. <laughs> <laughs> we, I think we were on place, weren't you, for your second second ever event of Therapy Live, and I think that was the one where it, it went live, and then yeah, you had no one could no one could view it or something. 
something crashed and those kind yeah, of things that's always another one, that's another yeah because that's the thing is that uh, the, the, the bigger the bigger failures of, of of not setting up but at least we created something in 2020 that um it worked it, it worked enough and that there were enough goodwill that then there were some glitches but it did it did happen and it was such a ridiculous innovation at the time. It's such a it's ten a penny now again online conferencing. Oh, well done. But, <laughs> but in June of 2020, to do a six stream simultaneous conference, um, and yeah, just annoyingly, twenty two and a half thousand people turned up to it. Like it's just ridiculous. It's like so it broke the internet. You know, it didn't have the bandwidth to tolerate mm. that because they told they told us that that no one ever you get you get twenty thousand signups. Um, so with 25,000 signups, you're never going to get more than 60% then turn up. Yeah. They said, because it's the pandemic, you might get a bit more than that. Did people, you, pay, did people pay for it? That one you didn't. No, right. we'd have, okay. it, was, so, yeah, it was, it was advertisers because we're going to get a did. lot of people's eyes and then you and then you record this content, sell the content. If you sell the content to five to 10% of it, then we're going to, we're going to survive because yeah. um, it's you know, a lot of people. It's just a, cl a classic basic funnel, but you, just, you won't need more than 20 thousand people's worth of bandwidth across the world and uh and, and yeah it, it, 22 and a half turned up so it started <laughs> to strain under the weight and i was watching it all fall away so then what the year the year after which when you're on about we put in every safeguard because that had happened the year before and that people were giving it another chance um and and um just a, a completely you know random um i can't remember the details now but it was something like there was a uh, a simultaneous event that had done a similar thing on their server across in like Japan or something 20, you know, within the same 24 hours that killed the actual oh company God. of which we bought the bandwidth of. So all the checks and balances. So we then looked into, we, we had to, cause it would like, it cost us a fortune. And we, um, we had, we, we looked into, we're going to have to sue them. So we looked into it and our solicitors looked into suing them. And then the, 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 the company credibly said, if you sued us and everyone else who's, events went down for an hour or so that day when sued us then we'd have to that's an, you know, even if you got together and did a credible class action you'd have a point the elder were their hands up and said we're sorry and we really are sorry um but they'd have had to have tried to sue upwards to amazon web services who's just you know eventually there was this various yeah. different internet outages that day yeah it was like a strange one because the, you know just a time where even some massive websites went down for a day and stuff like that so it's shit happens, right? It, yeah. It's just it's, it's bad luck. But fortunately, it wasn't an overt failure. And and by that point, yeah, you are just learning to adapt and stuff. And and, and I think for me is that I'm really appreciative of all the cultural capital I, we in, as people and as a brand had managed to achieve so that when that happened, I was able to go out authentically and say, this is what happened. It really is. It really is the truth. We'll do everything we can to make it right. Those of you that, that uh, couldn't get on at all, here's the content for that. You know, there's stuff like that where people have given up a day of their time and stuff and they were annoyed at us, but they watched us do everything we could to get, get it right. And they wouldn't have given us that leeway if we hadn't have been doing things right for many years before. Yeah. So you, yeah. eventually it comes good. And, and I think we've, we have sort of uh, survived it in many ways and, and people still trust us with it. Um, even in this more congested market, we're still um, a leader in many of the different subsections. And as a very small and lean business that can do much more interesting things than some of our competition do, because uh, again, and also the usefulness of us yeah. spending our own money and it being very personal and family centered. Have you guys got any more questions before I round the podcast off? Loads, <laughs> maybe, maybe one more. Um, mentors. Do you still have someone you look up to? Yeah. Someone you, someone you aspire to, someone you aspire to be like or continue to learn off or whether it be a, another physio, okay, someone who does a lot of research or, or whether it be, I don't know, someone in your family or anything like that. Is there someone who you reflect to or? Yeah, I think um, I think what, what's happened is it's ended up being a bit of a, a suite of different people because as I mentioned before, the uniqueness of both my work and my career and my personality means that then you end up in a situation where if you add one or two mentors that... And even if they were, let's just imagine they were advising you on, they were absolutely, absolutely spot on, but the, the differences of opinion you might have, mm. you'd always end up in a situation where you're, like, you're not having to comprehend this other thing that you don't do. So the differences between their experience and your experience would end up being really centered in that advice. And so you need to then try and find people of which you're, they're, they're mentoring you on a certain subset of something, you know, the, the incredible fortune to uh, people like um, Andrew Walton's a good example. So Andrew Walton, 
Um, very similar story to me in terms of what, 20 years earlier, set up a, a private practice that became several private practices that became Connect Health, one of the largest providers of MSK services in the country. Is he the one you recently had on your, 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 you've no, had interestingly, on your no, that's, that's the Australian Stuart Patterson. Guy. No, that's a different, it's a very similar story in lots yeah. of ways, but actually, and, and, but me, I don't know Stuart as well. Whereas uh, Andrew Walton, someone that, um, yeah, a, a mentor and friend of mine and, and someone I've worked with on a number of things, including the, the non-profit and supported a mm -hmm. lot of our stuff. And supported me as a person, but it's just that, he's, and he is, a, he is a mentor and a friend, but it's just that there are relevant differences that he's not, that if me and he, if he's trying to give advice as to what he's doing and stuff, what, what, and he'll admit that a lot of his advice, every time we go for a beer, he's just like, well, you could just try and stay and you learn a little bit. Yeah. Now, when I'm giving it like, how did you do it, Andrew? And he's going, I didn't do all your mother mad shit you do. <laughs> just get on with the get on with the clinical business. That's what I did. So yeah. eventually I asked to check out of the advice game. So yeah. what I've needed to do is I've needed to then have other concurrent mentors that are pursuing, say, PR and media leadership. Because Andrew's like unfortunately, for the sake of diplomacy, I needed to put a lid in that and just get on with the, you know, we've got to open our seventh practice or we're going to tender for this business and stuff. And um, and and that's just not what I'm doing. And so I can learn a lot from him as a, as a businessman, as a person, as a friend, as a, a bootstrap uh, therapist that got ahead of himself like I am. But then eventually there is a bit where you need to then find a concurrent mentor. Yeah. And so uh, sorry to always give a, a naturally broad answer. It's that it never ends up being one person for me. And I really do encourage that for people mm -hmm. because otherwise you end up in a situation where your mentors, it feels like sometimes I see people that, that the mental can try to take become them so as such. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You can, you can, you can really, you can only take you so far until you either try to emulate different pockets, different people, and then become your own person. Yeah. Well, you can just, got, you just never, never forget to try and just be radically honest with yourself. Like the, the, you've got, you've, you've got to you not know, strip yourself back so that you can't rebuild it. Like some people are too, too hard on themselves and, and that. I don't want that. But it's just that if you don't, if you don't really know yourself, if you don't know your strengths and weaknesses, but still accept yourself for who you are, you can't aspire to then create a patchwork quilt of different mentors that can support each part of you, mm -hmm. knowing that you, you're not going to be like them and you can emulate certain parts of it. But the bits that are different aren't worse. They're, they're just different. And, that, you know, I think that that's where it can make a massive difference, where noticing things in yourself, noticing differences between you and said mentors, because you, you're going to encounter them um, at different parts of your life where it really suited. And then you might grow apart or it might be relevantly different. But that doesn't matter. and You don't have to discard them. Yeah. You fall out about it because you want to go a different track. I mean, you know, Andrew, again, he won't mind me saying is that this is, I'd be very surprised if he looked on at some of the stuff I'm doing. I mean, he might still think it's daft. He tells me it's daft. Yeah. You know, he, didn't, he didn't get it sometimes. But it doesn't it mean that then we go, don't go for a, another beer and he just judges me heavy on it. So <laughs> I just can't mention you anymore because you're just being a moron. I just surprised it'd be more to do with the fact that, um, you know, that, that's just a, a, di a different track and that he, he, he enjoys the fact that we disagree on some stuff and it yeah. just doesn't matter. But you've just got to try and find ways in which you can really try and suit your own goals. And it's just like, if you don't, if you don't properly know yourself, you're never yeah. going to be honest with it. Like people, uh, and you guys have been really honest about that in, in what you're doing in the, in the podcast is, it's just do not do things out of obligation. Yeah. You know, like just don't do stuff because that's that's the way. Uh, and, and, and you know, I can speak to it with with you guys, but it happens across any industries. So yeah. There's just, there's a, there's a path in which people just naturally want to want to tread and you understand why, and it's often the path of least resistance and stuff. Yeah. But and some people, by the way, that is what suits them. Right? Yeah. I've, I've come to realise that. I said, oh Lord, the bloody sheep! What are they doing? Like just following and just doing narrow things. It's like no, they bloody love that. There's a security in that. Yeah. That suits some people. But if you notice you're not, then <laughs> then, then you're gonna need to Feel find a bit another way. Yeah, you would do. And so I think that that's the that's the thing that's worthwhile, and you'll just never regret that. Mm. It could go wrong, and you can't re you can't regret it really because there's, you've got that to fall back on. I think that's what's useful. Talking to three professionals, you're not you know if, if we were if we're doing this podcast somehow on the street and you're all homeless, sort of pursuing <laughs> some random ass mad goal, that'd be a different thing. <laughs> but you're talking about three professional people that are no doubt talented in lots of different ways, of which you've got some hellish fallback plans. You know, plan A, B, C is going to be all right. You know, you're in that situation mm -hmm. use that use that privilege wisely by giving some a whirl and fair play you are doing lads so i'm, I'm preaching to <laughs> the very kind of you <laughs> doing something doing something different right giving it a whirl and i just think we'll never regret that mm, definitely right finish the podcast we normally ask the guests same question really it's 
kind of a reflective question a little bit deeper and take yourself back to being in school. You're just doing your A-levels. You're going, should I apply for physio? Should I apply for journalism? And obviously now you're in this position where you've, you've went for physio. If you reflect back on that, was it a good decision? Are you happy kind of in the place you are now? Is there any regrets or are, are you, you kind proud of, of what you are? Are you proud so of what you've achieved, I guess? Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was the right decision <laughs> and in, in, in so many ways, but, um, yeah, I'm not, um, no, I, I'm, I'm proud of what I've accomplished so far, but, um, still lots to come. Yeah. Well, I, I, and it's cheesy cause I, I <laughs> said this at a job interview and it's a, I'm quoting a song that's not even like a popular song, <laughs> but, but it just really rung true this lyric. And, um, and it bothered me for many years of my career, as I mentioned earlier about my, my age was a bother at that point. Uh, but it made me realise this lyric, and I was I was uh, getting the I used to cycle from where I live uh, in Altrincham to to Warrington on the on a on a mountain yeah. bike to get a six a.m. train down to the London train down to to Lichfield in Tamworth to then go up to the hospital to do two days a week to prove myself as a I was working as a band eight a part time. Uh, whilst building up the business that then became the clinic. And it was just like making sure I proved myself across the different space to create credibility. So I wasn't just a you know, guy in private practice doing something flashy. Yeah, you still had the NHS. You had that, you had that credible sort of uh, working under a, a great consultant therapist there. And now listening to this song and it just said, uh, one of the lyrics was that I'm a little too young with not enough time. <laughs> and I said, that's one of the, it really spoke to me because I am proud of what I've achieved, but not half of what I think... I can do and the reason I'm getting on with it and trying to do it as young as I can is because that's so often what people will, will say uh, but I'm unfortunately vulnerable to people saying that you will be too young to do what you're doing but if you don't get on with it you won't have enough time to do it and so you know you, you don't know you've got to choose your regrets a little bit and just try and get on with it so yeah I'm proud but pff, you ain't seen nothing yet I guess it sounds cranky, <laughs> but I, I really mean it <laughs> oh well it's been it's been a pleasure Jack having you on I think whether you've met it or not, it's been very inspiring. And uh, I feel like it, it's been great to hear your story because obviously we've met you previously and I've had a placement with you, but I don't think we've kind of talked through all the, all the kind of his, no. history of where, what, where you've been and where, you, where you're going. And I'm really excited to see kind of what, what happens for you in the future as well. Um, but yeah, I, th I hope everyone listening or watching has enjoyed it as well. If you're watching on YouTube, if you could subscribe and like, uh, that'd be really much appreciated. Leave any comments. If you'd like to come on and have a chat like Jack has, we'd really, really like to have you guys on. Um, and yeah, if you listen on Spotify, you can leave some comments. I think there's some polls on the bottom there about what you thought of the episode. And yeah, we'll, we'll see you in the next episode. See you guys. Thanks, thanks for listening. Bye.